Hi, I'm Marcus Fares, founder and editor-in-chief of Dezine, and welcome to day 12 of Dezine 15, a digital festival celebrating Dezine's 15th birthday. As part of this, we asked 15 creatives from around the world to come up with ideas for how to change the world over the next 15 years. Each day, they'll be presenting their manifestos for a better world. Today, we're speaking to Natse Audrey Cheza about her proposal. Hi, Natse. Hi, Marcus. How are you? Good. How are you? Super. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Tell us a little bit about where you are, first of all. I understand it's not very warm where you are. Uh, no, I'm in Oslo. Uh, so the sun went down um, a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> it's a couple of months ago. <laughs> a few months ago, uh, it went down and everyone has been living under a hole ever since. Uh, no, it's, it's very cold and it's very dark, um, but the air is clean. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about yourself. Who are you and what do you do? Um, so I am a designer trained in architecture, um, but pivoted to the world of um, biology and emerging technologies around biology. Uh, I'm really fascinated by materials. Um, I'm fascinated by where they come from and what it means about where they come from um, and how it signals where we're going. So right now we are about to enter a material revolution that is based on biotechnology customizing living properties in um, cells for them to have functionality that they've otherwise not had. Um, this is interesting because it means that how we think about architecture and the built environment will change, how we think about fashion will change. Um, but at a more fundamental level, we are um, confronted with the fact that once our, uh, the very sort of substance of how we make the world around us changes, so too do our systems. So my design practice interrogates all of these spaces. How would you describe yourself then? Are you a bio designer or a synthetic biologist or just a, a designer who happens to work in, in, these, in these areas? I, probably the, the latter. I, um, I'm definitely not a synthetic biologist. Um, I, I am, uh, uh, as I said, design is my, my training, um, but I am really invested in uh, trying to pull new understanding of what the field of synthetic biology, for example, means for, for, desi for design. And to be able to do that, um, we have to engage with the world of technology and science in a very fundamental way. So we bring our design knowledge to that space um, and it indeed, I think, nourishes what we're doing. And so there's a definitely a um, cross um, pollination going on. I was gonna ask how you go from studying something like architecture to working an area like um, um, biology. Um, or biotechnology. Do you actually do biotech yourself? Do you put on your lab coat and get out your microscope or is it more that you're working with people in that field, helping to explain and understand what they're doing? I started off in the lab. <laughs> um, I uh, was doing my master's um, in material futures at Central St. Martin and was really inspired by um, a lot of the reading I was doing at the time about emerging biotechnologies and realized that the impact of designing biological systems on the design industry uh, in years to come would require designers to, to work in the lab to understand what was um, at play. So when I graduated, I did a residency um, at University College London in a synthetic biology lab, and I never left. I'm still technically speaking a resident, um, but much of my sort of design work and experimentation happened there. Um, and I think it is because I can understand it from a practical sense that it was possible to start to build out the theoretic too. So the two happen in tandem. Okay, so this is probably a good point for you to share your manifesto of what you think biotechnology might bring to the world and how we can make sure that it's done ethically and um, for the benefit of all. Yeah. Should I share my screen? Yes, please go ahead. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess we've started talking about it a little bit, Marcus, um, but really for us at Baby Futures, um, we look to nature to provide the starting point for re-envisioning design. Uh, nature not only teaches us how closed loop systems work, but that no two systems are uh, necessarily alike. Uh, nature embeds lessons on reciprocity, regeneration, adaptation, transformation, and a fundamental instinct, I think, to provide care. 
So that over futures, we've been investigating how these lessons can start to inform um, our design approach through a set of principles for doing um, that essentially nurture opportunities to create transformative systems at the intersection of design, um, biotechnology, um, and society. So our first principle is that we act in the defense of a world to come. So biotechnology is a rapidly uh, developing and evolving field that is bringing new possibilities and promises of untold innovation. Um, it offers us an exciting toolbox for alternative futures, um, but I think that much of the work that needs to be urgently engaged with um, is how we actually use these tools responsibly. Um, and so I was invited uh, last year to join the World Economic Forum's Global Future on Synthetic Biology. Um, and really it's a group of um, individuals from around the world who work uh, in different ways around uh, emerging um, synthetic earth biology industries to bring in their insights uh, and uh, expertise to generate um, essentially what will inform global policy recommendations around synthetic biology. So as the only designer in the room, um, I think uh, part of the work that I've been trying to um, uh, embed here is that design can be um, an enhancing practice to how we think about these features and how we actually think about implementing them um, and what the council have been focused on is how we can actually build a values driven approach to um, the emergence of this technology. And so can we center um, humility, equity, sustainability and, and solidarity in the practice of synthetic biology and essentially what would that require us to do and engage with um, and from a systemic um, perspective. And uh, in true West style, the way in which we um, have sort of uh, disseminated this information is through a report, which is now available um, to, to access uh, freely on the World Economics Forum's uh, website. The report is called Revisiting and Realizing the Promises of Synthetic Biology. And it really maps out um, this, this values driven approach based on um, insights of what has gone right so far in the industry, what has not worked out, so well and uh, where we'd like to be and how we might go about in setting up frameworks for that to um, happen. Um, the second principle we have is um, designing for systemic change. A design provides a framework for thinking and doing and we wish for preferable more equitable features, then we have to think of ourselves as um, uh, designers who can create the actual circumstances in which um, any of the above can happen. So at Baby Futures, we're really trying to combine design methodology with biotechnology in order to locate uh, both material futures, um, alternative uh, materials, uh, as well as the actual systems in which they will uh, fit in. And so a really good example um, of this is Project CD Color, which your readers may or may not be uh, familiar with, um, but essentially it's uh, an ongoing research project that looks at how um, microbes that produce pigment naturally um, can be uh, grown in such a way as to uh, color textiles. And what we are really acknowledging here is our need to divest from fossil fuels uh, is tied to a need to divest from them also in terms of our material output. And so if we can grow microbial colors instead for uh, the textile industry that are um, using less water and uh, less intensive in terms of uh, chemical usage uh, and a complete reduction in, in toxicity, then this is a massive win. Um, how do we actually start to become craftspeople with these grown materials? I think what the work has um, also taught us is that, yes, we can replace materials and, um, and, and chemicals and processes that are harmful, but actually what we need to start to do is recognize where design has interacted with the wider system to uh, produce certain output. Um, we, as bio designers, if that's what we will call ourselves, uh, are generating beautiful new materials that supersede uh, petrochemical material, materiality. 
um, but they all exist within these systems. So if we end up designing uh, new materials, but for landfill, then we've missed the trick. Um, what do we need to also design um, so that the actual uh, sort of the, the, the amazing opportunities that these new materials uh, provide us uh, in, in their env environmental credentials can be met with um, a social responsibility around material use. So um, where design has moved from craft to manufacturing to design for consumption, um, corporate st strategy and uh, value added services, we're really asking in a world where we start to put nature first, um, what else can design uh, do and uh, who are its stakeholders um, in, in that regard. The third um, principle is um, that we recognize a continuum of time and scale. Uh, where emerging biotechnologies are operating in a complex, uh, within a complex uh, continuum of time and scale, um, the choices that are made in the present uh, are influenced by those of the past and um, indeed will influence the future. Um, so uh, as designers operating at the dawn of these new technologies, I think we are very aware that we need to take responsibility for embedding compassion at every point um, of this continuum. And this project, a uh, project called Mutupo, is one that really demonstrates um, what is at stake. What is going to fuel the biological revolution is um, an incredible uh, access to an incredible amount of data, biological data. Uh, our ability to read um, DNA sequences of uh, any ecosystem to know what, what is in there and therefore what is of value that is in there is really starting to shape industry in, in biotech. And we stumbled upon a data set um, of my, uh, the microbiome of a, an indigenous uh, group of people in the Lake Ayasi uh, region, the Hadza people, um, that completely fascinated us. Um, and it was through the interrogation of the data set that we discovered that um, what is at stake, uh, I think, with uh, the, the, the continuum of time and scale is that we have a relationship with gathering um, living materials from other parts of the world and bringing them into a very, um, um, how do I say, this is a very complex project and <laughs> I find it really difficult to unpack um, the, the core essence of it. Um, but maybe if I, if I start here uh, with um, the, the unrealized version of the project, um, with an installation that was supposed to launch at the uh, Biennale uh, earlier this year, but didn't because of the pandemic, um, we created um, through this data set um, microbiome portrait of um, each of the members of the Hadza uh, who had contributed their gut microbiome to um, this uh, data set. And what we're trying to show here is that beyond um, being data points alone, um, there's a humanity to the people who have contributed to um, the actual data set. And so how you actually start to re-envision this creates new layers of representation, I think, that allow us to have much wider conversations about who owns biological data. Um, and to what extent we can talk about consent in a world where we're going to be data mining to fuel a synthetic biology revolution. Um, the next uh, principle that we have um, is that we really want to think beyond categories and conventions. Um, I think that for us, the emergence of biotechnology uh, is opening up a, a new world, one that cannot be viewed from the lens of the old. Um, terminologies, categories, and definitions of existing systems have essentially become limitary, uh, limiting and exclusionary. So as the boundaries between um, sort of the evolved and designed systems become less distinct, our language needs to shift um, towards representing a more intersectional, interconnected nature uh, of uh, the technology and community that, that are at play. So um, the sort of cross-disciplinary uh, and broad perspectives that we're trying to bring to um, synthetic biology are represented here through the Ginkgo Creative Residency, a project that we initiated with Ginkgo Bioworks, which is a biotech company in Boston, where every single year since uh, 2017, we've invited creative practitioners to bring their practice into this uh, environment 
um, and interact with uh, Ginkgo's suite of technologies um, and bring a, a project to fruition. Uh, the project has been going on, as I said, uh, since uh, 2017. So far, we've had residents looking at, um, I myself was a resident, um, looking at bio uh, biological um, uh, pigments. Uh, we had uh, Yasman Shiri in 2018 looking at biosensors um, and um, how they could um, start to generate a more ritualized um, relationship with um, in the environment. Uh, Andrea Ling in 2019 um, brought in um, sort of intersection of biological fabrication with digital fabrication technologies, um, focusing her work on decay. Can we actually design for decay? Um, and what sort of parametrics do we need to start to embed to be able to do that? Um, Monica Seyfried and Cyrus Clark um, were our first virtual residents owing to the pandemic in 2020. Um, and they uh, looked at how we can uh, ritualize um, behaviors around the microbiome um, in an open call that focused on skin. And our resident this year is Ayana Cotton, and she's looking uh, at language and metaphor. Uh, the language that we use to describe these emerging technologies has the power to define it. Uh, what other languages, what other met metaphors exist um, that take us into a different space? Um, and then finally, uh, we pursue mutual benefit through collective effort. Um, in any biological system, the whole can only flourish uh, only if every part thrives. So successful biodesign solutions must empower the many and not the few. From a microscopic level to the scale of the global community, we seek to co-design systems built on plural perspectives, collaborative approaches and collective efforts uh, in embracing more than human worldview. Um, one of the projects that have come out of the uh, World Economic Forum engagement that we've had is BioStories. We've developed for the forum um, methodology around stakeholder engagement um, that uh, democratizes conversation about synthetic biology so that more people can have a say as to what their biological futures um, might look like. And so we had the opportunity to uh, not only showcase the methodology, but test it um, at Dutch Design Week um, just a few short weeks ago. Um, and what you're looking at here is um, people bringing their own seat to the table um, to uh, sit in dialogue with uh, invited contributors to questions framed around those core values of the council, looking at how um, these questions filter and start to permeate um, our everyday existence. And so what we designed as a, as a studio here um, was the, the furniture, uh, the choreography around what it means to come together in a circle to um, talk about what is at stake um, for our living world, but also the, um, the scaffolding around how you in initiate conversation around uh, what are quite complex issues. Uh, in a way that's accessible to, um, to everybody. And so this is uh, the first bio stories. Um, we hope that we are able to launch um, many others um, and in wanting to do so have provided, are in the process actually of consolidating uh, a kit to uh, effectively um, build out your own bio stories because no two stories are the same and um, the more stories we have, the better. Um, these insights will also be um, enveloped and folded into the recommendations that we're making uh, at a policy level at World Economic Forum. Um, and so I just think it demonstrates the way in which we can create the kinds of spaces we need to be able to talk together about the future we want to um, shape. And so to conclude, I think that... Um, our principles learn from nature, really, to model values, different uh, values driven design. I don't think that they're unique to the field of synthetic biology or otherwise. I think these are principles that um, any uh, design studio operating today can um, consider and uh, map onto their own practice. Thank you. Thank you very much. If you could unshare your screen now. Thank you very much. And um, in the, the five principles that you just mentioned and, and which you wrote about in uh, your manifesto, which you, we also published today, um, is this the first time that anyone has attempted to codify how biodesign design could be used? Is this sort of a, a very new area of research? I think it is. And what has been um, really hard for us to do is 
just evaluate our practice to see how these things are manifesting. So what comes first, the principles or the work? And I think that for us, the work has come first. Um, and we've been trying to refine our approach um, by sort of looking at, you know, across across the board, what's happening in lots of different sectors, what the, the tenor of the conversation is to say, actually, how are we doing sustainability? How are we thinking about equity? Um, how do you bring people around the table to sit together to, to, to have a meaningful conversation that can actually have an impact? Um, and so from a biodesign point of view, I, I do think this is new in, in, in the sense that it consolidates work that has been ongoing that not only we are doing, other people are um, working in this way in, in, in different aspects as well, but to, to codify it in this way, I think is, is, is new. Well, thank you so much for allowing us to be the honor of publishing this, first of all. Um, but you mentioned near the beginning of your talk that you often the that you're the only designer in the room. Does that mean that the field that you've been working in isn't used to design, isn't used to the idea of design, isn't used to design processes? Uh, yes, I think it's um, it's that there's a misunderstanding that design is only one thing, which is to make everything look nice. Um, and so there's a propensity in these scenarios for people to look at you to make the slide deck because they trust that you will make it look nice. Um, what has been a challenge actually is helping people understand how we can help them think, um, help, help them uh, provide clarity um, and help them unlearn perhaps um, some of the biases that exist because of the world in which they exist. Um, within uh, design as a connector, I think is something that's maybe new uh, in a lot of the spaces that we're navigating, uh, or as a bridge to other fields, uh, as a bridge to other domains. Um, and so, much of I think the work that we do is try to is build trust first of all um, with uh, our collaborators, um, build shared language and shared goals to be able to demonstrate where design can actually um, enhance what efforts are, are happening. And do you find that also people expect the designer to want to turn the research into some kind of product? Yes. Um, and, and I think that's important because that's the question of dissemination. Um, I made a quip that, uh, WEF, there's a report, and, and there you go, there's a report. But what if it was more than a report? Um, who else would have access to it? Um, no one reads books anymore. Everyone listens to podcasts. It's, it's about what kinds of medium can you use to expand and extrapolate and to share the idea? And so design, I think, can be useful. And in, so we found in this process, in this particular example, um, that the need to have um, some kind of uh, product as or collateral as product is very important because it demonstrates and materializes um, sometimes what would otherwise exist as an academic paper. Mm. I, I meant more not so much in the outputs as in a kind of way of communicating the, the technology, but as in like an actual thing that you could buy. I mean, I, I imagine most people outside the design world think that design either is there to make things look pretty or to, to sell more stuff mm -hmm. or often both at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think you're getting at the heart of something really important, um, which is... Do, is your question, do we need design in biotech so that we can make product? No, I was just, I was, I, I'm getting around to a, a different, a, another mm -hmm. question, which leads on to this, but I wanted to understand from the people in the biosciences, what their perception of a designer is and, and what a designer does. You, you mentioned that you make, they expect you to make things look pretty because mm -hmm. I was going to lead on to then like, this work what is the purpose of this work? Is this purpose, is it research for its own sake or is it because it's funded by some tech fund from the West Coast that then expects that to be commodified at some point down the line? Um, I think that our own research um, is uh, driven by many different kinds of motivations. Um, Project City Color, for example, is to really understand what it means that our products are going to be grown in the future. Uh, and, um, and and what that demands from from design. Um, I also think that uh, designers are going to have to be able to speak to this by designing well-designed products. Uh, so for us to know how to design well-designed products, we kind of need to get practicing now. 
Um, so I, I think it's really multifaceted. It's not it's not an either uh, an, um, an either or scenario. And of course, the whole biotech sector is is absolutely huge, um, multi billion trillion um, dollar industry. Um, does and I suppose it's a big question, but does the sector have a moral compass? Clearly, you've defined a, a moral standpoint for the work that you do. But by and large, is the biotech sector full of scientists who are working for the good of the earth or capitalists who are working for the good of themselves? Or is it a real mixed bag? Where, where, is, where is this big, this big um, juggernaut called biotech heading? I think that is probably there's all sorts of people working in the industry. Um, you have people working for corporations. Corporations work for their shareholders. So it, it is very complicated. Um, I think what I am most excited about is that some of the leading biotech companies are engaging very seriously with this question of the values-driven biotech. Um, because that's potentially um, where the more long-term outlook uh, lies. Um, I think we're learning from companies like in Silicon Valley, like Facebook, about what people don't wish to become in the future. Um, and for that reason, what used to be CSR, um, you know, greenwashing, people are having very serious conversations about how they actually demonstrate the claims that they wish to be able to make. Um, and part of that is a realization, and I think we touched on this in the report at WEF, um, of some of the overpromises that have been made in the past about what biotech can do um, to secure, you know, funding, to secure, um, government funding even for, for that work, particularly in the context of sustainability. Um, but people are going to have to be able to demonstrate um, how those values are actually instituted um, from governance to the claims of the products that they are bringing on board. And I think that work is going to be ongoing. The pressure to be able to engage with it is only going to get harder, well, only going to get, only going to increase. Um, and so I am heartened that some of the leading biotech companies right now are engaged very seriously um, with these issues. Hopefully it starts to permeate um, and for the next generation of startups in the field. On the first day of the Design 15 Festival, Es Devlin um, called for designers to sign, a, to sign a code of conduct that they would do no harm to the earth. I mean, maybe biotech could do something similar because I think in a lot of people's minds uh, biotech is kind of a frankenstein field you know on the one hand you have the covid vaccines which some people don't want to to have and on the other hand you have things like genetically modified foods and so on and so forth that it, it it can be a sector that because because it's not possible to kind of grasp it yourself it's done in a lab it's done by people with strange outfits it's kind of it involves changing the very building blocks of nature it, it's very easy for people to freak out and be suspicious of it is that yes. part of your task to demystify as well? Yes, and it's not to demystify to make the Frankenstein stuff palatable. It's to for us to have a more um, nuanced conversation about what is at play. If you talk about replacing harmful chemicals uh, with um, with biologically derived um, uh, chemical inputs, for example, people are less scared about that than they are the notion of designer babies. Um, so where is the design of biology happening? Is it in my body? Is it um, outside in a factory making clothes? Um, it, the, the specificity of its application um, base, I think, um, is what is going to determine how people receive it, but, but also how they are made to receive it. Um, where is the choice in it? Um, can we consider and imagine a, a world where people participate in the design and fabrication of these biological systems? What would we have to, what, what other cultural technologies would we have to develop to facilitate something like that to happen? Um, so I think if, if we can um, be very specific about where we're talking about um, biotech, but also start to understand that um, transparency isn't just making the lab visible. Transparency is using languages that we can 
all understand or piece together. Um, then we start to have a more mature conversation about uh, where we wish for the field to go. Um, and I also think the very real fears that people feel about these technologies will be taken more seriously because they will be coming from um, a, a place where people can provide nuance as to where those fears actually lie. We're speaking just after the COP26 climate conference and you mentioned um, about uh, materials that don't involve petrochemicals. So could you paint a picture of, of the potential for biodesign and related fields to actually achieve that? How, how, and also, could you give some concrete examples? How could we replace uh, a plastic or even a, a fossil fuel with something that is grown that also then doesn't have knock-on consequences, negative consequences for the planet? Mm -hmm. I, 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 I'm not going to assume that there's nothing that has uh, knock-on consequences because I'm, I'm not a sage and I can't tell the future, but I think that there are um, some promising technologies that are being developed right now that will make a huge impact on carbon emissions. Um, concrete industry, for example, is one of the most polluting and carbon intensive industries in the world. Um, and if we could figure out a way of uh, building uh, without that carbon input, that would be fantastic. And I think bio um, concrete is a new material innovation that starts to point to uh, towards that, that particular future. But so far, um, very few companies are working on this. Uh, Biomason is one um, in the US um, and seems to be one of the only ones that is making, um, that is achieving the kinds of economies of scale we need to um, see to see this through. Um, I, when I look at the fashion industry, um, they are, if, we, if we don't have petroleum industries um, driving our materials, our material systems in, in fashion, we're going to have a material shortage problem um, in so many of our materials are fossil fuel derived. And so when we start to look at alternatives like fungi uh, for, le for, for leather, for example, um, uh, or, or, or vegan leathers, I should say, uh, that had otherwise been using uh, petrochemicals as um, uh, as a, a material input. Uh, I think that there's a lot of promise there too. Uh, and then in terms of um, fibers like um, spider silk, um, for example, where we are moving away from uh, polyesters to uh, silks that have um, customizable properties. I think that's the one thing that is becomes quite exciting for me is that we're no longer just talking about replacing harmful chemicals or replacing harmful materials. We're looking at how biology has evolved all of these incredible properties that the fossil fuel age type materials couldn't necessarily give us. And that we can actually program um, that level of functionality um, in these natural fibers. Um, so that we don't need, um, uh, you know, your sort of heavy duty Gore-Tex material anymore. Perhaps the silk is programmed to be able to have those same properties. It's just something we, we weren't otherwise able to do without uh, synthetic biology. So um, I, I think that the potential for um, new materials that help us to decarbonize is immense. Um, and then what has to happen alongside the development of those technologies uh, is understanding what the impacts are. And if the impacts are tied to how we think about scale, that these startups is only successful if they become the next big conglomerate, then I think that's where the mistake lies. Uh, we also have to think about how um, we start to distribute the manufacture of these biological technologies so that we can think about scale in a, in a, in a different way uh, and, and in a context specific way, because these biological technologies are um, really coming from the old uh, art of fermentation, which requires yeast to consume um, sugar, for example, uh, to be able to generate the, um, the material output. Uh, where it used to be alcohol, we might think this yeast rather is going to create silk. Um, but the yeast still needed to eat sugar. Where does sugar come from? It comes from the land. So we can't develop these technologies without thinking about land use um, at the same time. So it's, it's not just a case of uh, technology wonderful. We have to think of the whole system and how we redesign that 
so that the scalability of this is rooted in um, something that is sustainable. And another Design 15 contributor, Jalila Saidi, a few days ago, was was very provocatively saying that you know nature is very adaptive, is very innovative, and she wasn't quite saying this, to, but to paraphrase, like whatever we throw at nature, it will eventually figure it out. Is there a role for biotechnology? Is there a world work role for biology to kind of undo the damage that's been done by the fossil fuel era and the era of, of steel and concrete? Could, could we develop microbes that eat that stuff so it disappears? Happening. There's a company in the US um, that's working on um, bioremediation. Um, can you can, can bacteria be designed to eat oil um, off of spills, for example? Um, can we use it to uh, degrade plastic um, and to metabolize it and potentially to create something different with it? Um, so yes, in in terms of repair, there's a lot of work that we could do um, towards that um, and it's you know w one thing I always say is we are really at the beginning of this and um, these technologies are so nascent they really are um, what I would love to see is um, I think where we're coming from right now is um, a bunch of tech startups that have been building the capacity for us to use technology in such a way, uh, the platform technology to enable us to create these apps, if you like. Um, what we don't yet have is a broad church of um, applications. And what we have to ask is amazing technology, awesome power, what are we going to do with it? And I think um, to your point, we, we have a lot we can build that's new, but we have a lot I think that can be repaired um, as well in the process. Another thing that Jalila said a few years ago, actually, when I did a, a talk with her, was that we need more science fiction. We need people like her, people like you, to, to paint a picture of how things could be better. And then simply by putting that vision on the table, it allows us to work towards it and then hopefully maybe achieve it. Is that a sentiment you, you believe in? Yeah, I think um, this, this, uh, this notion of cultural technology is really important. How do we even, how do we build um, ways to, even, to imagine something new, to imagine something different, to imagine something inspiring? It's really difficult these days. The world just feels a little bit shit, but <laughs> we actually need to engage with and um engage with the possibility of, um, of, of, of hope, I think. Uh, and, and part of that is, um, I don't want to say the speculative because I think it's different. Um, it, what kind of a world do we wish for? Um, how, how do we build that? And I think our work is trying to figure out what infrastructure you need to be able to build that alternative. And that infrastructure isn't necessarily glamorous. Um, it's not something that you can publish on a day-to-day -day basis. Say, look at what we did. It's a lot of hard work behind the scenes to develop relationships and trust with people who don't know why you're in the room. Um, you know, that's so much of hard work is centered on that. Um, and, and that maybe that can sort of birth a project that, that isn't afraid to fail. Um, because I think so much of this is tied up to our fear of failure that, and therefore we don't imagine anything better. Um, but we, we must do both. We must imagine better and we must not be afraid to fail. We must document how we did it so that we can learn why we failed. <laughs> you said of one of your own projects earlier that it was difficult to unpack and I, I think you've done a really good job of unpacking it. Thank you so much, Natsa, for being part of our birthday festival. Thank you so much, Marcus. Happy birthday, Dazeem. <laughs> Thank you. See you soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.